Good afternoon, everyone. I can see that we have lots of people continuing to pile into the webinar room, but we have such a lot to get covered today. So I think we might get started. My name is Kirsty O'Connell. I'm the Industry Director of the Institute for Infrastructure and Society in Society at the Australian National University. And I'm joined today by my panelists, Professor Sarah Bice, Dr. Kieran Moffat, and Ms. Donna Groves, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we do get started, everyone. Uh, today, you're gonna have a number of opportunities to interact with us as well as um, hearing from the panelists. What you uh, will be able to do is to complete interactive polls, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got 20 screens opened on my page and I'm trying to trying to see my notes here. Um, we, you'll be able to post questions in the Q&A, please, rather than the chat so that we're able to moderate that discussion uh, and to get to everyone's questions throughout the course of the event. Um, we also have a number of interactive polls which will pop up on your screen. We would love you to complete those because hearing from you and understanding your experiences is just so important in terms of adding to this research that we do have underway. Um, we would love also your feedback on the session. So you'll see a link in the chat at the very top and I'll post it again at the end of our session where you're able to tell us what you thought of the webinar, how we can improve for future events because we are looking forward to a, a very long future with the NCEIF and a number of webinars where we're able to share research insights with the wider industry through our wonderful partners there, Donna and her team. Um, you'll also receive a, a recording of today's event and a link to share with your colleagues. Um, and we do encourage you to do so. This isn't research to sit on a shelf, it is research to be put out into industry and used. So we really look forward to uh, you doing exactly that. And certainly if you like what you see today, then please do get in touch with us uh, we're very eager to hear from potential partners, research participants, people in industry who just want to connect with what we're doing. The best way to find us is through our website, www.nextgenengagement.org. Uh, and that's, um, that's always a, a good way to get all of our various details. So I'd like to uh, start today as well by acknowledging the fantastic partner community. Sorry, again, I'll get the hang of this before the end of the session, hopefully. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our fantastic partner community. And I think we have a representative of every single major partner and supporting partner in the room today, which is really exciting. Uh, it's not often that we're able to bring absolutely everyone together. The work that we do just doesn't happen without our partner community. And they bring so much more than a financial investment. Our partners really do come with an intellectual contribution and a real will to see fantastic best practice engagement in the infrastructure sector, not just because it's a good thing to do, but because it's a smart thing to do. And they really are part of creating that ecosystem that we believe will help good engagement to thrive. I'd particularly like to acknowledge our major partners, the Victorian government via the Major Transport Infrastructure Authority, and each of their various major projects, Lend Lease, Transurban and the Queensland Government through their Department of Transport and Main Roads. We particularly appreciate your involvement and your sponsorship. It's a very different kind of relationship that we have with our partner community because our partners participate in every aspect of the work from the definition of the question, explaining what the problem is, what the challenge is that industry are grappling with, right through to undertaking the research and then helping us to define the tools uh, that we can deliver for industry to make that research outcome easily digestible, easy to use. So we really do appreciate their involvement. I do, I do have to flag that we give our partners a little more detail uh, than we'll be giving today, but we're very appreciative of their generosity in enabling us to share insights from the work with the wider industry. That's one of the things that they're certainly contributing to. And we, we do have openings for further partnerships. Uh, if you sit there and enjoy what you're hearing today and think that that's really important, then uh, we'd love to talk to you about that. We, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to just briefly explain, for those of you who've been with us for a very long time, you may know us as the Next Generation Engagement Program. And we started this journey back in 2017 with a pilot program, which uh, Professor Sarah Bias and myself co-founded. We now have a home uh, within a fully fledged research institute 
at the Australian National University within the very prestigious Crawford School of Public Policy. And we have wonderful support from the university's senior leaders, which is enabling us to deliver a world leading program of research. We still believe that we are the only program in the world to be looking at the impact of community engagement, social risk management and social license on infrastructure project selection, design, planning and delivery. Um, and in particular, understanding how those various factors are impacting project performance as well as community outcomes. I would love to hand over to my very good friend and colleague, Professor Sarah Bias, who can talk to us about the broader research program, which I2S is delivering, uh, and the context of Australian perspectives on infrastructure within that broader program. Sarah. Thank you so much. I just had a Zoom experience where uh, I couldn't unmute myself. So I'm very pleased that my dear colleague, Kirstia O'Connell could unmute me. And I'm really hopeful that I am unmuted because I cannot see Zoom um, at all on my computer. So this is gonna be fun. Uh, Kirsty, send me a text if I'm still on mute because I genuinely can't tell. Uh, we are so pleased to come to you today. And I would like to begin myself by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land where I'm broadcasting from today, beautiful Melbourne, Australia, and to pay my respects to elders past and present, wherever you may be located today. It is wonderful to have the Institute for Infrastructure and Society established and to be able to present to you today some really interesting insights from Australian perspectives on infrastructure. This is another first from I2S. We are running the largest study into community engagement in the infrastructure sector in the nation, and we're really proud of it. We are exploring a problem definition and research questions that were defined with you, with an entire cross sector of the Australian infrastructure sector. We are entering now our sixth year of the Next Generation Engagement Program from 2022. We're in our fourth iteration of the State of Infrastructure and Engagement Survey, results of which are currently being analyzed and our fifth survey will be in the field pretty soon and before the end of the year, we hope. We also, through our program, have been able to work directly with partners like Melbourne Water, Transurban, Len Lease, the Victorian Government Major Transport Infrastructure Authority, the Queensland Government, to develop the Infrastructure Engagement Excellence Standards, which is a world first standard of quality assurance for community engagement in major infrastructure projects. We have our supporting partner, Oricon, who's working with us on precursors of social risk, looking at how we better understand, identify, mitigate, and manage the social risks associated with major infrastructure projects. And in the work that we're here to present to you today, we are really excited to dig into our first major national survey of the Australian public done in partnership with leading social research firm, Vaconic, whose CEO and co-founder, Dr. Kieran Moffat, is with us today. And I'd love to introduce you to our panelists. So many of you know me, and I'm very pleased to be with the Australian National University uh, and able to now host the Institute for Infrastructure and Society. Dr. Kieran Moffat is going to present the results of the Australian Perspectives on Infrastructure Survey. And in doing so, this is a world first public look at how the Australian general population is feeling about the contributions, the potential for infrastructure to play a role in post COVID recovery, and also to really explore those feelings of the silent majority, the ones we really would like to know most about. Our current survey results, which we're presenting today, the national survey, were done in alignment with a series of pulse surveys in nine local government areas, which are intensively affected by major projects at the moment. Those pulse surveys are underway, and we can tell you a bit more about those towards the end of today's session. Kieran Moffat is one of the world's leading researchers and practitioners around social license to operate. He and I have been lucky to be colleagues for quite a long time now. Kieran's the CEO and co-founder of Vaconic. He's a social scientist who's committed to helping organizations, institutions, 
and industries, and he's worked quite a lot in the mining and extractive sector to build deeper and more constructive relationships with the communities they work with. And you'll see his expertise shine through in his presentation in a moment. And we are also so thankful for the partnership and support of NCEIF. And Donna Groves is here today. Many of you will know who she is, a community and stakeholder engagement and communications professional who is bringing over 20 years of experience. Donna specializes in infrastructure, natural resources, and governance projects, and we'll be very pleased to welcome her as a panelist following Kieran's presentation. Kirsty, because I can't access my controls, I'm gonna ask you to mute me, which I'm sure is something you would have liked to do many times in our long standing relationship. And I'll hand over to Dr. Kieran Moffat. Thanks. Sarah, thanks Kirsty, um, and uh, good day everybody. It's excellent to be here with you to present back a, a bit of a slice of this national survey that we've been conducting with uh, with ANU um, and the Next Gen Partnership. Um, it's really exciting because we had license to go beyond the the usual set of questions that that um, people might be interested in in this space to go beyond. You know, how's COVID really um, affected the way infrastructure is being utilised to really try and um, take a longer view about uh, and a deeper view about what are the things that underpin um, a strong, reflexive and productive relationship between the sector as a whole um, and the general Australian community. And as, uh, and as Sarah hinted at uh, there, um, we have two parts of this research program happening simultaneously. This piece that I'll be presenting today about a national perspective, so the views of, of, uh, of Australian citizens around um, uh, the infrastructure sector, uh, and then we'll have the local voice really feeding into uh, this understanding as well down the track. But here in this presentation, the next 15 minutes, I'm just gonna give you um, a curated understanding of, of what's coming out of that, of that national survey work. Um, now just a little bit of background here. Um, in this kind of work, what we're really trying to do is understand more than just what people think. We're, we're really trying to understand why they think that way and to pull apart the nature of the relationship that community in general have with an industry, in this case, or a sector, however you wanna, wanna frame it. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so we're applying different types of analysis techniques to allow us to, to tell those stories. And that's really what I'm gonna focus on in this presentation, which is the the, the why people think that way, the way that they do, um, the nature of the relationship um, that infrastructure as a sector has with the community, um, and, and importantly, what is a recipe for improving that relationship? How can we thinking about and focusing on the, on, on the issues, on the processes, on the topics uh, that are actually going to, to make that relationship stronger? So let's start with, with what we did. So it was a national survey. We collected really fantastic uh, number of people here, three and a half thousand from across the country. On the right hand side, you can see that the distribution of participants by, by state or territory. Um, uh, and this sample was, was representative of the population by age and gender. We also had a really good diverse spread of, of, uh, of education levels as well. So going into this analysis, we feel really secure. That, um, that, we, that we can genuinely talk about what Australia thinks uh, around, uh, around the infrastructure sector. We jump to the next slide saying, so I thought we might um, just start with perhaps a little bit of a surprising insight that, that came um, out of this work. And, um, and, and that is that the experience of people with infrastructure in general across the country um, hasn't been quite perhaps what we see in social media, in the discourse around infrastructure, um, certainly around the, um, the interactions that, that many of us are having um, in our work with, with communities directly um, and as they are, uh, as they're interacting with infrastructure projects. So the, the graph on the left there, I think is particularly interesting. Overall, how do you feel about the amount of infrastructure development of the community over the last few years? You can see that the average score there is right on the middle point, which is 3.05, and that represents, uh, you know, 50% of people saying it's about right. The amount of infrastructure experienced in their community is about right over the last few years. And critically, though, you have people on, on either side, and I think in terms of risk, um, uh, there's a, a significant minority proportion of people on the left-hand side of that graph who feel that there's been um, too, too much, uh, sorry, um, on the right-hand side of that graph that feeling like there's been too much 
um, development in their local in their local community. So around 25 to 26% of people quarter of the sample feeling like in some ways that there's been too much development. And the right hand graph um, is I think interesting too and a real testament I think to the professionalism and uh, and the work of practitioners in the space, but also uh, I, I think rubs against the grain with respect to maybe general um, accepted experience or wisdom around the experience of people alongside infrastructure projects, which is that in general, um, more people than not have had positive relationships with infrastructure developers. The, the real risk here though, is you have a lot of people that are neutral in that space. Uh, maybe they haven't had direct experience themselves uh, of course, we're doing this as a national survey and the local surveys that we're going to be um, talking to you about a little bit later are really where we're going to get into the nitty gritty of what is the experience at that local scale. Now, as I said, this is a curated snapshot of this national survey data. We've got more analysis to do, including whether people have got uh, a personal um, first-hand experience with projects in their, in their area, whether their views differ significantly from those who haven't. We will, we will do that and we'll be talking about that down the track. But if we move to the next slide, I'm just going to show you what we measured in general, that the richness that, that exists in this data for us to explore um, over time uh, before we go into, into the main body of this presentation. So here you can see is a really long list of things that we measured. We really went to town to get a broad baseline understanding of, of, uh, of all of the interaction points and issues that influence the nature of the relationship that community members have with the sector as a, as a whole. Some of these things you would expect to see some of them maybe a little bit new. Things like wellbeing and resilience as a baseline measure of capacity of communities to manage change, to, to adapt to change and, um, and, and work with, um, with developers, um, as well as then things like the role of regulation, really um, uh, uh, interesting um, uh, kinds of, of concepts that we're including in here, as well as some from our work in the area of social license to operate in general, like procedural and distributional fairness. So I'll, I'll be talking about those a little bit more in a second. So let's jump into the meat of it, um, Kirsty. We might jump to the next slide. And what you're gonna see here in, the, in this slide is the product of what we call a path analysis. And this is a, a, a really um, fancy, useful statistical technique that allows us to, to describe the nature of the relationship or, or the or the recipe for social license to operate, in this case for infrastructure as a, as a whole. Um, and so what you're looking at is a stylized version of the output from, from, that, uh, from that test. So let me just explain what you're looking at and then we'll pull out a part because that's gonna give us a real good grist for the mill in our, in our panel discussion. So first thing to note here is that within each of the boxes that you can see in that model are a collection of questions from the survey that through some other analyses we determined clump together to really measure something quite similar. Uh, and so we, we clump them together and we use that in, uh, in this, in this uh, test to then look at how they all relate to each other. The real power in this test is that it allows us to look at the relative importance of, uh, of different experiences and expectations of community members, primarily those boxes on the left-hand side and their influence on our key outcome measure here, which is acceptance. Um, of, uh, of infrastructure development in Australia on the right hand side, that acceptance measure being a proxy for social license to operate. The next thing to notice is the arrows tell you the direction of the effect. So, um, uh, and all of these relationships are positive. So more trust in infrastructure developers leads to, not surprisingly, greater levels of acceptance of infrastructure development. And so that then tells us what we need to be working on um, to, a, to a, uh, affect um, a acceptance. The next thing I'm gonna, gonna just point out here is that trust sits very centrally in this model of infrastructure social license to operate at a national scale. And that's not because we put it there, that's because it's the best fit of the model to the data. Uh, and so, uh, and what that's really saying is that trust is acting as a mediating variable in this model or as a, um, a vehicle that translates community expectations and experiences of, in, of infrastructure development, their attitudes around infrastructure development and their levels of acceptance. Trust is also really useful in this concept, uh, in this context, um, because it has real utility in this relationship that trust is the benefit of the doubt when things go wrong. It really leads to that, that capacity to forgive. Um, it's also really important um, to enable innovation and to try new things. 
Um, it's, uh, it's really important because it's the, the stretch and given the relationship so that when announcements are made or, or when development's underway, um, that communications and engagement activities aren't viewed through such cynical eyes. So trust ha really has practical utility in this conversation. And it's also important, this position, uh, because it helps to reshape the conversation from how do we build acceptance or how do we avoid rejection by community of infrastructure development to how do we build trust in the developers doing that development. That's really an important shift in the nature of the conversation in this space. So, of course, the next key question is, well, what is it then that leads to trust? And that's those four boxes on the right-hand side. They're number in, numbered in terms of their importance or their relative importance in driving trust. Uh, in this model. So let's start with number one, regulation of the infrastructure sector, the sense that the confidence the community members have that there are external mechanisms, um, regulatory frameworks and boundaries a way that, uh, around the way that they do their work um, that ensures they do the right thing. The more people are confident in those mechanisms, the, the more they trust infrastructure developers and the more that they accept the development that takes place. And that's really interesting because in this, you know, in this model is a little different from other industries where regulation here is, is number one, those formal mechanisms for good governance uh, and, uh, and delivery that, that in some ways that, you know, when I think about the role of regulation, uh, I think about regulation as reflecting a point in time um, uh, level of community expectation around how an activity should, should be undertaken by an industry or a company. And so the fact that that is the number one driver of trust Infrastructure also then speaks to well, what is the role of, it, of infrastructure developers and regulators and government institutions? And what is that really saying about um, uh, how we should be thinking about those relationships? So that's a number one driver of trust. What you can also see is it's got a straight line um, to acceptance as well. I'll talk about that in a second. Now, the second strongest driver of trust, however, is this concept of procedural fairness, or you might call that industry responsiveness. And that has a couple of key components, one of which is that industry listens to community perspectives um, and takes action based on the concerns of community members. It's about having and seeing a voice inside the development process and seeing that that development um, trajectory is flexible um, and accommodating of those, of those perspectives. Um, those two drivers, regulation and procedural fairness, by far the two strongest drivers of trust in this model. Um, the, the third and the fourth driver there, much less important but still significant. Um, number three, um, the community have self, uh, the community self-determination of benefits. And what that's saying is that, um, that the community have agency in that conversation. They understand the process by which development takes place um, and their role in that. Um, and so you can see that there is some overlap with procedural fairness or responsiveness as described and also with regulation, in fact. Um, but also that there is a local benefit that's derived from, um, from this development, that it's not just for the benefit of um, maybe communities that are far away, that are linked together through linear infrastructure, or the benefit um, that might be accrued by, um, by those projects and their developers and their shareholders. But in fact, there is some local amenity benefit or functional benefit derived by local communities. And then the fourth strongest driver in this model is um, uh, that there are positive impacts on the local economy. And this, this isn't about necessarily uh, that it's delivering local jobs, but more that there's just a sort of sentiment or vibe um, that there should be some local benefit that comes directly from that activity of development of infrastructure um, for people who live, who live locally. Now, if we shift our attention to, I think the other key part of this model that's really interesting and important in our current context which is one of the things that drive acceptance, but don't actually influence acceptance through trust. They're not affecting the relationship that people have with developers, but they are affecting the level of acceptance that community has of infrastructure in and of itself. And, and the, the primary driver of acceptance is that infrastructure is key to COVID-19 recovery. And so this is stuff like, um, is it a good use of uh, uh, a taxpayer funds? Um, to actually um, uh, accelerate um, and fast track infrastructure um, to aid the, the recovery of the economy um, and that uh, the, the general sentiment that major investments like that are an important part of our economic recovery. The more that people believe that, 
the more that they uh, feel accepting of major infrastructure development. Um, uh, the next is, uh, I think, a couple of interesting caveats around that um, for me. So they're independent drivers of acceptance, but for me, they all operate as a package here, which is that they deliver, that infrastructure um, projects deliver value, um, that, they're, uh, that they're more, more useful, sustainable, um, that they deliver benefit for taxpayers, they reflect wise public spending, and also um, worthwhile benefits to all Australians. Um, and the more people feel that way, the more that they accept. And, and finally, that you have a voice, the community again have a voice that, that developers communicate with impacted communities effectively, um, that there's a broader opportunity to have a chance to, to voice opinions about local, uh, local projects. Um, and I think importantly, that people understand how the planning process works. Um, uh, the more that, that, that cluster of, of items, the more that people feel that way, the more that they accept uh, infrastructure projects. So let me just step back here a little bit and, and frame up and summarise what I think is going on in this model. First thing to note is that relational factors are really important. Those things that, that, that we know and love uh, and are our bread and butter in this, in this area are really important for building trust, which is procedural fairness, having voice, um, uh, making sure that, that we're being responsive in design um, uh, to the perspectives and interests um, and stakes that community bring to the table. That is fundamental to trust. And in this model, what we're seeing is that trust is fundamental to managing risk. And so it immediately gives us some numbers around the business case for great local um, and community engagement and, uh, and engagement practice. What we also see, I think really critically here is the, the really fundamental role of regulation um, in uh, building trust and mitigating that risk as well. Um, and maybe that's uh, a little bit different to how the conversation about infrastructure um, uh, is, is happening at, at local, uh, local levels and perhaps within uh, the developers that are, that are building infrastructure. And also I think what, what this data is showing, of course, is that uh, as, a, as a key mechanism, as a key platform for, uh, for economic recovery from COVID-19, infrastructure is seen as really important, but there are important caveats or layers in that conversation that it needs to deliver value. It needs to be a good use of taxpayer funds and community need to have a voice in shaping what that looks like so that um, uh, that's where acceptance come from. If we get those elements wrong, that may lead to, to rejection of specific or, or more general infrastructure uh, development in our major centres in particular. Um, so uh, I might leave it there and just use that as, uh, as input into, into the conversation um, uh, with, um, with the rest of the panel. Thanks, Kirsty. Kieran, fantastic job and such an interesting worthwhile piece of research. Um, I just wanted to flag for all of our um, for all of our audience participants that we now have, and sorry, I'm just starting my, my good friend Sarah Bice's video as well. She's had a little bit of a technical problem on her end. Uh, so I'll just make sure I've got that going. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that we do have polls running right now and you're able to answer those. We've already had 57% of our audience vote on those three uh, poll questions. You'll find them in the top strap if you go to the very top of your screen. Also very keen to take questions from the audience. Cara, thank you for giving us one to go on with as soon as we go to those open questions. And um, we'll, be, we'll be happy to take more of those throughout the session as well. So yes, I'd love to move on to that structured discussion. Apologies again. Sorry guys. I'll leave it on the trust model because this is some of the stuff that we really wanted to pick apart. And looking actually at the responses from our audience, particularly around the first question, you know, which are the factors that we would expect to be most closely related to community trust? It seems that a lot of us were surprised to see regulation come up as such a key thing. And it's really obvious when you look at the model that trust is such a, such a critical factor in terms of building project acceptance, it's clearly not fluffy. It's something that really matters. And with regulation being the leading factor, I'd really like to invite each of the panelists to talk a little bit about this factor, you know, this idea that actually transparency, faith in institutions, you know, faith in both the regulators and the regulatory process are fundamental to building trust. 
And if you could perhaps each share some of your own experiences in that vein and what you think the implications are for the way in which we need to engage with communities if we're to have stronger levels of project acceptance. And perhaps Donna, you'd like to start us off if that's okay. Throw me right in there, Kirsty. Sorry. <laughs> well, I know you've got that wonderful experience. We know you can handle it, Donna. Big <laughs> what, are you, what are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, look, this is exactly what we're seeing, and I'm sure to most of the participants, it's, it's, no, it's no surprise to us that trust, a lack of trust equals outrage, outrage equals not accepting the project. I love, as a planner, I love that number one is regulation. Obviously, I'm a community engagement professional, but I, I have a planning background as well. So I love that those the planning, that legislation, that communities want to see transparency in that. Right down to noise regulations, I'm seeing on site people now say, well, how, how far above DBA, above background, should that be? And they're checking it on their iPhone. And that that level of transparency that we didn't see 10 years ago, I think they're expecting that at a greater level now as well. So they're expecting it when it comes to planning legislation, they're expecting it when it comes to EISs and communities want a voice in each step of the process. And I think that um, this is going to be very interesting in the politicisation of projects on, on how projects are selected, how we look at them in the fairness around it. I think we're going to have a very interesting future, but the results aren't a surprise. I said when Kieran talked me through these results, I said, wow, everything we're doing is validated. This is really interesting. So great work, Kieran. Absolutely. And I, I think particularly interesting, you know, at a time when we're seeing, you know, the Edelman, Edelman Trust Barometer telling us that trust in public institutions is declining. You know, perhaps this is, or, or, you know, I'll throw it to the panel, is this a wake-up call in terms of the trust we build in regulatory bodies, in regulation itself? Kieran, what do you think? Yeah, it's a really uh, great question. We have seen, and, and I should just clarify, this is about the importance of regulation in driving trust. This isn't a reflection of people's ratings of the effectiveness of regulation. So I think that's, that's the first thing. And actually, you know, the ratings reflect that drop in faith in institutions. Um, but also, uh, you know, I think there's a question here to, to be asked about what is the function of regulation? Um, and, and the way that we frame these questions speaks to regulation reflecting, uh, sorry, acting in the best interest of, or reflecting the interests of community members, that it's almost like their proxy um, in the conversation about what's acceptable. Um, and, and I think that's a particularly interesting way to, to look at regulation. Um, the other key question here to ask is, you know, the importance of regulation in, in driving trust and, and in this model of social license um, does it in fact reflect the, the community are, are kind of looking to somebody else because industry haven't done such a great job of that in the past and they're looking for another mecha mechanism to reflect their best interest? I think that's an interesting question to ask ourselves. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think that uh, the, the regulation, you know, the relationship between regulators, uh, the, the institution and industry is something that's un, undercooked. And often um, industries talk about regulation as a, as a problematic entity, that, that it's a, there's red tape, it's a, it's a time suck, it's, it's getting in the way. But actually what we can see here is that we need to be thinking more broadly perhaps about how industry you know, reflects, uh, sorry, uh, respects the, the decision make, made by the umpire because that's important for building trust in the sector as a whole and the developers that are actually building stuff. So, you know, building a stronger, closer relationship um, with the mechanism, not the regulator itself, but the mechanism and its importance might be something that industry, industry could consider. And just finally, that, that we do see the importance of regulations increased in this type of modelling, not just in infrastructure, but in other industries where we work like, um, like agriculture and, and mining, in fact. So it's not unique to infrastructure, so maybe this is again part of a larger societal trend. 
Sarah, what, what do you think? You well, know, Karen, I think that's such an important point. And as someone who works in a school of public policy, um, before this webinar, I was in another with colleagues who are exploring uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme and um, priority access to vaccinations for uh, Australians with disability. What all of us can see and feel very materially in the past year plus, <laughs> I'm here in Melbourne, I feel I've been in lockdown forever, mm -hmm. um, is, is the, the genuine day-to-day -day implications of policy and, and of regulation. And so I think there's also something important here in these incredibly timely findings that they are capturing a point in time where the Australian public who have responded are perhaps feeling uh, more connected to or affected by regulation than they might in other times. Because when we look, look at our poll results and certainly when we look at research that we have done in the past, uh, people have been really concerned about social risk, about community opposition, uh, regulation and policy backflipping in our state of uh, infrastructure and engagement survey. Year on year, regulation and policy pressures are one of our top three factors which are seen as being most influential to major infrastructure project outcomes. So from that perspective, this isn't surprising. What I think is, is really important for us here is that regulation is being seen by the public as really connected to trust and also to that acceptance. And another aspect of this is that as a policy scientist, I know, unfortunately, that regulation almost always lags reality. And so we'd probably have a situation here where Australia is in the midst of its most intensive infrastructure delivery period in its history. I've got guys, you know, just anecdotally directly outside my window here uh, doing a big project, laying concrete. The kids love it. Lots of machines. But the point is that regulation has been based on our historical delivery intensity and timelines. It is project by project focused and it fails communities in its lack of accommodating cumulative impacts. And so I think what we're also seeing here is that the regulation and the policies themselves are not up to speed with the intensive delivery that communities are experiencing. So you've got this combination of a need for transparency that builds trust, but also what builds trust is that communities feel confident in the settings of the regulation itself to accommodate their needs and to ensure that they are going to not only get the most optimal benefits from projects that are delivered, but also to have a smooth experience. Thank you guys. Um, I'm mindful that I really want to let our audience have a go at some of this. So I'm actually going to combine our next two structured questions. What I'm saying is that community participation is still coming through really, really strongly when we're looking at the trust model. There are still implicit and explicit factors that point to the importance of community participation. We're also at a really interesting stage of the study. So we've, we've surveyed 3,500 Australians across the country. It's demographically balanced. They may not, however, be Australians who are personally impacted by delivery. So this big group, which we're sort of thinking is the proxy for the silent majority, are saying that they feel quite supportive of um, infrastructure as a driver of economic recovery. You know, it's contributing to the social license. On the flip side, we haven't yet gone to those infrastructure intensive locations. And I'm really interested for your thoughts, as well as your personal experiences, what you're seeing on the ground about how the localization of community might play a role as we think about what comes next for community participation in infrastructure and indeed what, what we might see in this next phase of results as we go to those more impacted communities. How do we think that's going to play out, the economic versus the local impact and the local importance? Donna, would you like to start again? It's such an interesting question because the, the our politicians have really sold the, the belief that more infrastructure generates the economy. 
um, and on the ground, that is accepted. You do hear that, but that's until you're individually impacted. That makes a big difference. So this next round of surveys will be really, really interesting. Um, what I'm seeing on the ground, what my team is seeing, what we're hearing through our NCEIF members, what's certainly coming through for our next conference is that communities are more activated. Um, obviously, the trust that Kieran's found in the survey, which is really interesting, the lack of trust is coming through when it's a project on the ground. Uh, people being more activated and more political as well. So we're seeing local members being CC'd into the initial complaints. But where engagement's done really well, we're seeing people have value for the engagement, having ownership. As I said before, I don't think these survey results are gonna be a surprise to many people on this call because we work in infrastructure community engagement. We talk to these communities. We know that when we do this right, when we involve them in the planning, when we involve them in the design, we don't often involve communities as much as we should in the actual selection of the infrastructure, but if we did, we'd get even greater results, I'm sure. But when we, when we listen to the community's voice, when we absolutely act on that voice, and even if it's not, the infrastructure isn't what somebody has said they wanted, if they can see that it's a fair and transparent process, if they can see that the regulations are being acted upon, if we're fair, if we're transparent, they will accept that the project will go ahead and they will accept the impacts. But I think what this survey is saying is, is great infrastructure does drive economic reform. We've all struggled with COVID. We're worried about our future economically. I think that we accept that, but I think on the ground, we need to do greater engagement. We need to be more transparent. And if we genuinely engage, if we include the community in each stage of the process, we will have acceptance of, pro of projects and we will have trust in developers, in government, in regulations. That's what I hope anyway. Fantastic. Sarah, what do you make of this? Look, I think it's interesting that if we look at today's poll, because we were talking before today's session, we were kind of saying anecdotally, do you think that people are becoming more neighborhood focused? What's the role of local amenity? Is this going to change, for instance, project prioritization or the ways in which we engage local communities and indeed their expectations? What's interesting, and, and it'd be great if we could do a formal survey on this, not just a Zoom poll, because I always love more data, uh, but we can see that about 39% of our respondents here today um, are saying that, you know, the communities in the neighborhoods, they are a bit more activated, but we also have uh, about 31% who are saying, look, there's been no change. So it'd be really, really interesting to do a geographical analysis to start to look at that. Uh, I think the points that Donna is making about what we know and don't know about community engagement are incredibly important. And part of the reason that we have forums like this one, and we have in this room, the absolute superstars and major players of infrastructure in Australia, is that often this information and the situation is known so well amongst community engagement professionals and practitioners. And our role as the Institute is to get this information out more broadly and to really start talking to those who may not be the converted, who may not understand the value of community engagement. And I can see, for instance, that Richard Parsons, who's done amazing work with the New South Wales government around helping to shape advice on stakeholder engagement, particularly in social impact assessment. And the 2020 guidelines are now expanded to incorporate infrastructure projects. He's asking the questions, you know, how can regulators leverage their influence and that acceptance to shift the narrative on red and green tape? We do have this perception and it's, it's a very Australian perception, but it's also, I think, um, one that's common globally that we want to cut red tape, we want to reduce green tape. Uh, what I would say is that it's not so much about getting rid of tape, it's about using better tape. Um, so that's, that's where I think, Richard, that needs to go. And, you know, are there jurisdictions doing a better job of being more proactive? Certainly, I think the work that you're doing in New South Wales is incredibly helpful because what you are trying to do and what things like the SIA guidelines offer is improved quality assurance, better guidance, and a more productive use of existing regulation. So that's where I think we have a lot of opportunity uh, and some, some challenges. And Kirstie, I know you commented as well, um, you and I have worked with New South Wales government just presenting those guidelines to the infrastructure sector. Maybe you have some ideas. 
I think one of the things that I found really interesting on that whole concept of regulation, um, and which really just jumped out for me, was the idea that actually, if we don't also do a good job of accepting the umpire's decision, and I, I'm seeing this across a variety of industries, um, particularly the mining sector, but also in the infrastructure sector to a degree and urban development, where in some jurisdictions, we've seen some fairly vitriolic attacks by politicians and by members of the community, I'm oh, sorry, members of the industry on the regulators. And I think um, as much as it can infuriate us at project level at times, if we feel that the call was unfair or not well-founded, um, when, I, when I saw this information coming out from Kieran's team, it really made me think, well, gee, we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot somewhat um, if we don't respect the umpire's decision, if we aren't seen to respect the umpire's decision. And maybe we need to have those closed door discussions where we work to improve the regulation. And I think that's one of the things that, that this program offers is a safe space to have those challenging conversations. But I think when we're out there in the community, what this tells me is that we all have a role to play in terms of building faith in those regulatory institutions and building their reputation because if everybody starts to doubt them well suddenly the system just doesn't work whatsoever um that that was my personal take on it i think you know Kirsty, that um reflection is really borne out in the research so kieran and i can tell you we've both studied social license to operate for probably far too many hours of our relatively short lives and trust is absolutely critical and it's not just trust in government as an institution or an entity it's trust in the processes and procedures that are used and um, melissa has asked here kieran in the chat did the research look at the factors that reduce or perhaps destroy trust as well as the factors that build it now i know the answer to that question but i wanted to throw to you because you've done so much work within australia to build understanding of how to measure and model social license i think our um, attendees would really benefit from understanding that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess the way to read a model like that is that each of those factors can build and destroy trust. So if you feel really confident in regulation or if you feel really positive that, uh, that you've had a voice in, in the way infrastructure is developed, then that leads to greater levels of trust. But if you feel wronged by a process, if you feel like when you engage in, in, a, in a, a workshop or a discussion that you're actually um, uh, engaging on a predetermined outcome, which is a very common feeling in, in you know, mandated processes, that, um, that that's going to undermine and destroy trust. So I guess the way to think about it is that there's a, you know, a light and a, and a dark side to each of those drivers. And the other thing is that um, we're getting two bits of information here. One is that its role, each of those factors, um, but two, we're, we're also needing to understand where we're at right now in terms of benchmark. Are we low on those measures or are we strong on those measures? So for example, trust in infrastructure developers in general is about 3.17 on a one to five scale, which is in positive territory, but with plenty of room to improve. Um, and so, you know, that then tells us, okay, we need to be working on those, on those drivers to, to improve trust. Um, but I guess the other thing to note here about, about trust and the local context um, is that vulnerability uh, or, or the working definition of trust that I really like is that um, it's about being vulnerable with another and knowing that they're not going to take advantage of you. And I think that's why it has such a visceral impact on our lives because you immediately feel very vulnerable in a context that may be unfamiliar um, and regulation provides a way to help you alleviate um, that, that vulnerability that somebody else is help, helping to protect your interests. And as to, to Rich's um, project and um, and, uh, and, and Rich and I have worked together as well for a long time, good friends. It's a great question. What can regulators do in this space? Well, um, my experience from the mining sector, what communities would tell us all the time is, well, where is the regulator? I'm actually very interested to have that person, um, a representative from, from that institution here in the room. And my engagement with often regulators in that space, in that, in that industry, is that they might have had a really bad experience early on in trying to be more proactive and present in those conversations. Um, and, in, and in fact, they don't have the capacity, um, you know, in terms of people, number of people who do it, but also the, the skills or comfort to, to get into those messy spaces with communities that are feeling vulnerable. And I think that's something that, that, um, 
that a regulator could do is, is actually build their capacity to actively participate in the conversation to reduce sense of vulnerability and anxiety um, and to ensure that people can see that the umpire is there watching the process. I think that could be useful. I think that's such a good point, Kieran. And Kirsty, I'm just going to jump in here because one of the things that I think we have an opportunity to do, and this is why the Institute is so exciting to me as a research nerd, is we can start to connect findings from different projects that we do. And so one of the things that we measure when we look at social license to operate is promise keeping. Now, Donna can tell you, I'm sure that promise keeping for community members related to major project delivery, it can be as small as I will send you an email about that within three days. Now, in practice, we know from our research that community engagement teams are really small and relatively under-resourced. So if we look at our recent results from the State of Infrastructure and Engagement Survey, the 2019 survey showed that about 41% of community engagement teams working on major infrastructure projects within Australia have five or fewer members. So these are small but mighty teams. And this year's survey, the 2020 survey, showed us that most community engagement teams, their budgets are less than 1% of the total project value. So when we start to marry up findings like we have here today from Australian perspectives on infrastructure, the contributors to trust, knowing that promise keeping is an important component to social license to operate with other findings from our research that tell us about the size and strength of community engagement teams, their access to resources and budgets. We can see that, to use a term that Kieran just brought up, there is potentially some vulnerability there. And so there's work that we can do using this evidence base to start to combine these findings to really create a holistic and meaningful portrait that we've never had before in a sector-wide evidence-based way to really start to take and push decision making about how community engagement should be resourced and the role that it genuinely does play in project delivery. Thanks Kirsty for letting me make that comment. I think that's a fantastic comment and I'm, I'm seeing so many good questions come in and it really made me want to, I'm going to try and capture a couple of them in one because we've, we've had some great thoughts from the audience. I'm seeing um, Richard's question about how regulators can, can change the, the frame for themselves. I'm seeing Cara's question around connection with country as a starting point for greater social value and outcomes across infrastructure. I'm seeing the question from Lara around the role of social impact assessment. And it, it makes me think actually um, that integration is in fact one of the points that perhaps we're really missing in terms of, of the connection between dis different discipline areas as well as a way um, for projects to potentially use things like the social risk work that we're doing um, to really evaluate where a heightened level of engagement might be warranted from the outset you know to get a to get a scan on where communities are at and say okay well we know for this community that's had so many cumulative impacts that you know, has expressed so many times particular preferences. This is a community that needs a little bit of extra love and attention from the outset. I'm curious though, <clears throat> for Kieran, for Donna and for yourself, Sarah, as to how you think we can do more in terms of integrating and connecting the engagement discipline and other disciplines, other project teams, and indeed other organisations like the regulators to help create a more seamless and integrated experience for communities who are impacted by infrastructure delivery. I mean, Donna, I think there's so much here for you and your NC members. What would you say to that? I would say communication. I would say make regulations, you know, make them understandable. Make That's what regulators can do. I've just been through a couple of the most amazing EIS processes I've ever seen in my life. And one of them had hearings for weeks. Um, People, it needs to be simplified. People need to understand the regulations. They need to understand where they're in for Even if the regulations are still, you know, quite explicit, of course they need to be, but we need to simplify the process for the community and we need to communicate it and communicate it well. And I think that would help integrate. I think integration is interesting. Um, 
The other thing is we need to be more transparent. We're very quick to hide. I saw the question about social impact assessments. We're very quick to hide this information. And, you know, we'll use FOI processes and we'll use other processes to make it really difficult for people to get the information. Often it's, it's not that bad. It's quite interesting and it does justify why decisions about projects are made. But it's our nature, it's the way our industry has been and on, on the ground, on the projects to the community, there's often mistrust because are you hiding information? That even comes into that trust model. So to have trust in a regulator, you need to understand who the regulator is, what the regulations are and how the decisions were made. And if you can understand that, even if you don't agree, that's a big part of the process. That's, that's a personal opinion, obviously, but that's what I am certainly seeing and feeling. It's fantastic, Donna. I'm really conscious of time. We are at 2.28 and I'd, I'd like to just leave our audience with a few more thoughts because this is certainly the first half, the first part um, of the work. And there's, as you can see, there's a lot of really rich detail. But the next phase of work, um, which we're about to undertake as a partnership between Boconic and the Institute for Infrastructure and Society, is to go to nine specific infrastructure intensive locations. And within those locations, uh, and I'm just going to put them up on my screen so it's easy for you to, to all see, within these specific infrastructure intensive locations, we know we have multiple different proponents operating. We know we have some distinct community types. And I would really encourage members of the audience who've liked the insights to date and who would really like to be able to compare and contrast what our national baseline looks like as compared to an infrastructure intensive location, be it rural, be it a growing regional city or be it a metropolitan center. And indeed to be able to compare and contrast how the experience varies across three different states and three different planning jurisdictions. If you're interested in doing that, then we would love your support and it will certainly enable us to help give you the insights that can assist you in your work. Um, the way that you can do this is to use the, <coughs> excuse me, use the promo. <coughs> I'm so sorry, what a time. Use the promo pack, which we'll be distributing after today's session. <coughs> use the promo pack that we'll distribute after today's session it will include a suggested article that you could share with your impacted communities in these locations, the social media posts and the link to Australian perspectives on infrastructure. And we would very much appreciate your assistance on that. We will be posting a video from today's presentation via the ANU Crawford site. And I'll be distributing that link to all of our registered participants from today. There were some 200 of you. Thank you also for your very great participation in our online polls. It seems that we've got furious agreement that uh, we would like to see more community engagement and that indeed we think it, it's going to be requiring a greater investment as we look at going through the post COVID recovery. And the attendees were also um, broadly um, on the same page in terms of saying that uh, communities are either somewhat more or a lot more um, cohesive in their actions concerning major infrastructure projects post pandemic. So, you know, certainly an ongoing need for the role of engagement. It has been an absolute pleasure to have everyone here today. We will endeavour to also answer the other questions that were raised in the Q&A, which we didn't get an opportunity to get to. Uh, in a follow-up article, which we'll send out to participants. And I would really love if um, you are interested in giving us some feedback, if you could follow the link in the chat, which I'll be reposting in just a moment. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to our very experienced and learned panelists. It's certainly been a great discussion. And I think the, um, the interactive nature of it with our with our audience certainly um, spoke volumes about the fact that people were enjoying what they were seeing. So terrific job. And we look forward to seeing you again post phase two, when we're able to share and contrast those experiences of the infrastructure intensive communities versus our national baseline. Everyone, thank you so much. If you would like to see more, please come to nextgenengagement.org or you can also contact me directly uh, via the mobile number that I posted in the chat. Thank you very much.